or you get caught up into a, a worship time where he just draws you into a life experience. And, you know, you, you might have come to a worship gathering like this and maybe you plan to just spend an hour or two, but four hours go by and you're, and you're like just amazed that that time has lost its hold on you. And I've identified that when those times happened, that I happened to be in my life at that point of time in desperation, having a great need for him to pour himself out, having a great need for him to answer the cry of my heart, having a longing that, that nothing else could satisfy in my life until I was face to face with him. It was in that point of desperation where I was laying it all out, where I was expressing it out, holding nothing back, not being concerned about what I looked like, what people thought. At that moment of time, all I had a need of was his presence. I was desperate. If he didn't show up, if he didn't come in, in some, such a tangible way, it almost felt that I couldn't go on anymore. And it was at those moments of time that as I looked over the history of my life as a born-again Christian, that his presence became so real, so tangible, so manifested. And it was as though I was in a cloud. It was as though I was in a bubble, if you want to say it like that, where you were in another realm, another world, and all the cares, all the worries, all the problems, all the stress, all the pressure seemed to have just disappeared and, and you were just kind of resting in his glory. The torment <clears throat> that was once in my mind at that moment of time was gone. The concerns about how I was going to make it dissolved. The pressures of having to meet deadlines and and come up with certain things that I could never provide myself, it just seemed to melt like wax in the fire. And was in that place of peace, the shalom of God, in another realm, another dimension. It takes desperation in our lives. And that's why many times we never really get there because we always fight to be in control. We always want to make sure that we can, you know, handle the problem. Get the counseling for the problem. Come to a place in our lives where we can figure it out. Where, where we can find another way to get around what we're dealing with. To avoid a dead end. And all the time our Heavenly Father is just yearning for us to come to a place where we long for Him and nothing else. To a place where we're, we're just... We're just we're just broken before him and nothing else is going to make a difference. And he becomes number one in our lives. The focus is on him and him alone. The place where he can meet us. The place where he is attracted to us. The place where the invitation comes out of our heart and, and says, Oh my God, you're welcomed here. We need you. We long for you. We thirst for you. We hunger for you. It just attracts the presence of God, the, the brokenness of life and the humility that we find ourselves in because we've come to the end of ourselves, but oh, how we try to avoid those places. And, and we fill our life with religion, with the idea that we can sing a few songs and read a scripture here and there and, and feel like we've come into his presence. But we really haven't. You see, when you come into his presence, you get wrecked. I tell you, when you come into his presence, you can't help but to surrender your heart to him. You know how he longs for us. To come to that place where he could meet us and pour himself out in a true reality, in a real way. Matthew chapter 5, 
says this in the word of God, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The word blessed here is the Greek word makarios, which means to be so blessed that people are envious of you because of the blessing that's within your life. Blessed are they that are hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And people are jealous when they see the presence of God in your life. You become contagious. When the presence of God comes into your life, when it begins to overflow, not only does it bring a healing and a true satisfaction and a true supply of all of God's wonderful provision for my God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Not only does he fill us with his glory, which provides everything that we need, the peace of mind, the, the strength of heart to go forward, the desire to do the right thing, the ability to say no to those things that have been temp tempting us to make wrong choices, a hunger for more of him to become our lifestyle, to walk in the supernatural, to live In a relationship with the living God, can two walk together unless they be agreed in covenant relationship with each other? Not only does he fill us and meet our needs like that, but he overflows and begins to affect those that are around us. There's a jealousy in this world to want to see and experience the manifest presence of God. That's why people are longing for the supernatural. That's why witchcraft and, and, and the palm reading and, and crystal balls and, and all these things are so popular. These horror movies that, that have all this garbage in of the supernatural on the evil side. People are longing for the real thing. They just don't know where it is. They haven't found it yet. They haven't seen it. They haven't experienced it. They haven't come into touch with it. The world that we live in is longing for the presence of God to be manifested. They're longing to see the supernatural power of God. The true God. The one and only true God. To come in touch with their lives. And God has chosen you and I to be those people. To carry his presence. And so he brings us to places where we come to the end of ourselves, and yet we fight him. Oh, we can blame the devil for everything, but God is bigger than the devil. The devil can only do what God allows him to do. God is sovereign. The devil is a created being. God's all authority. The devil just stole authority. He's illegal. And yet God could use a negative circumstance in our lives to bring us to a place where we have no place to look but him. No one to run to but him. No one to look for but him. Nothing to try but him. The place that he longs for us to be every day of our lives. The church has missed it. Religion has captivated us as a counterfeit to what God has called us for and that is intimacy with him for he wants to show himself to us the world we live in needs a true manifestation manifestation of his presence in this realm in this life that we live in it longs for that and we see churches on every corner and new ones being opened every day Yet the crime rate has risen. Abortion is still a major mark against our country, our nation, and against the church. Broken families are the norm in life. Marriage is no longer a holy institution. What's missing is the presence of God. And you know, the only thing that God has actually called us to do is to worship him. 
He hasn't called us to do works in our own strength. He hasn't called us to build kingdoms. He's called us to worship him so that we can prepare a place for him where he can live and flow in us and through us so the world can see who he is. He's prepared a people, you and I, for such a time as this. Will we miss this moment of time in the history of our lives to meet the needs of the generations that live in the midst of us? Will we miss the call that God has given to us in this hour? It's a question you need to ask yourself. See, the problem with wanting his presence means that you have to live in a state of brokenness. It means that you have to be in a place where, where you really have to depend on God every two seconds. A place where, where you're humbled and, and, and you're longing for his presence to make it the next step. In other words... If you're going to be like Charles Wesley said, catch fire so that others can see you burn and then come to the same God that caused the fire, you're going to have to realize there's a great price to it. You have to realize that it's a completely different kind of lifestyle that we're actually living. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God is longing for people that are hungry for him. You know, I, I was telling this story. I don't remember when it was. Maybe, yeah, it was up in uh, Freeport. About how my wife and my family, we would go to a place called Burn, New York, where our New Life Dream Center camp was, a 128-acre camp where the men would go there after six or seven months or eight months, and they would go there uh, for a period of time before they came back and finished the program. And uh, it was a three-hour trip. And we knew exactly how to get there, and I would always start off by saying, this is a non-stop flight. We're not going to stop. We're not going to veer off. We're going to go there straight. It's three and a half hours. So get ready for this, folks. We're going to go there, kids. We're not stopping. And uh, so we would be traveling along the way, you know, one hour, two hours. And all of a sudden, two hours, my family started getting hungry. And I said, all right, we're, we're going to still make it. It's only, we got another hour and a half. In two and a half hours, they were getting really hungry. And it's one thing for the kids to get hungry, but when your wife gets hungry. <laughs> when my wife gets hungry... You better get out of the way because she's focused. We're going to eat. And, and so here I am on a journey to get there for three and a half hours, but now not the kids, but the wife. She's hungry. And so guess what? We turn off. We change direction. And we find a place where we can satisfy the hunger that's inside. We couldn't put it off. We couldn't go another hour. We were too hungry. We had to stop. We had to change direction. We had to put aside the original flight plan and take a detour because we were hungry. When you're hungry for God, that's exactly what happens. You change direction. You put away your own plans and your own idea of how you're going to serve them. And the only thing that could make a difference in your life is to be filled with him. The only thing that matters is that I need him. I desire him. I can't live the next couple of hours and, unless there is some manifestation in my life of his presence. There's a yearning that God places in your spirit. There's some of you tonight as I'm speaking, there's something that's stirring up in your spirit. God has put his spirit in you. He's longing for us to come to that place. Not just like one time. He wants us to live in that place. A place where every one of our needs is met. A place where the joy and peace of God takes us through the deepest, darkest tunnels of our life. A place where we're satisfied and at peace and in love with him and in love with each other. A place of the supernatural. You have to come 
to that place of desperation. And too often we try to do everything we can to avoid desperation. To come to the end of ourselves. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. And that's what makes people so envious of you because they really do want what you have. We look around, we see empty seats all over the place today. Is it because people really don't want what we have? Is it because we are religious and have a good understanding of God, but there isn't this supernatural manifestation, the reality of God in our lives where people want what we have, and yet God is leading us to those places? He leads us to desperation places. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you look at this for a moment, it says this in verse 17 and 18. For, for our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, <coughs> worketh for us. That's key. What you're going through is just a light thing as compared to what Jesus went through. Remember he took our place. Remember we sang that. He took our place. So what we're going through, even this very moment, as much as it seems like the dark night of your soul, though it might seem like it's the end of the world for you, is but a moment, momentary light affliction as compared to what Jesus went through on your behalf so that you would come out on the other side of the tunnel filled with his light and his glory. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment as compared to eternity, for us as a work, it's for us, it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. <clears throat> it brings us to the place of desperation. So am I saying tonight? I'm saying that if you've come into a head-on collision to a brick wall, or if you've come into a place where it's a dead end, or you've come to a place where all of the resources that you can muster up is done, don't settle for that. And don't think that's going to be the rest of your life. But understand that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. That God is wanting to use even that to bring you to a place of desperation. To where you hunger for God. To where you're willing to say, Lord, I want to be a container of your presence. Increase the capacity inside me to receive more of you. Some of us, our capacity is only just a little bit. And we can only do so much worship and we've, we've had it. Our capacity for God's presence is this tiny. And so we go through some things and, and then we, 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 we hunger and we're desperate and God stretches it. Now we have a, a greater capacity and, and then, then we, you know, we go through some more things and now we get a greater capacity and, and, and God wants to fill that. And, and then we go through some other things and before you know it, there's an increased capacity for God's presence in our lives. In other words, what you're going through, don't look at it as though it's the end of your life. Don't look at it as that, that it's the way it's going to be for the rest of your life. But look at it as an opportunity to come to the end of yourself, be desperate for God. To cause your, your flesh to be crucified to where your spirit that God created in you to cry out to him. He made you so that he can fill you. Tell somebody next to you, what a great opportunity I'm going through to increase the capacity for more of God's presence. We look at things like this many times as, as bad, evil, wicked things. We, we see these things and, and we, we kind of look at them as like, oh my God. And God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to turn around what the devil's trying to do and I'm going to cause you to look to me and hunger for me. Because this thing is going to work for you if you'll 
Lift up your eyes to the hills from whence your help cometh and realize he's the source of your life. God took the children of Israel out of Egypt. Though there was a lot of pressure and they were being persecuted, they still were very much used to whatever Egypt was supplying for them. And God wanted to take them out of there and bring them into a wilderness experience so they could experience his presence. So they can cry out and say, we got no water. And God says, I'm going to supply the water. To come to a place where, oh my God, we got no food. And God pours down the manna. Wanting them, wanting us to know that he is the source of our life. Not you. Not me. Not anything else. Not our government. But only Jesus. Do you know that there are so many of us that really don't know him as the source of our life? He's like a figurehead. You know, we worship him. But we really don't know him. And all along the way of our journey, God is wanting us to come to a place of desperation so that he can fulfill the call of our lives, which is to carry our presence. So these light afflictions, as compared to all that Jesus suffered on the cross on our behalf, if we'll understand that it's working for us to bring us to a place to cry out, not look for another way out, not look for another solution, but to look for him. Not trying to look for another substitute, but to realize that he became our substitute so that we can enter into this wonderful manifest presence of God that once you taste and see how sweet the Lord is, you never want to go back to religion. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's taken a long time to put out the fire that God had started in your heart in the past. But you still got a memory of it. There's still, still, still some smell of smoke in your life because you had caught fire and you remember those days. And yet there are others that are looking at me and thinking, I'm nuts. What in the world is he talking about? Why is he ranting and raving? Because I've been in the presence of God. And that's where I want to live. That's where I want us to be. I made a commitment to walk in this pray, place where his presence can live in me more and more every day of my life. I'm talking about a personal revival that comes within our own lives. Because we'll never have really the revival that we really want to see until we personally have it. Until we catch fire so that we can be fire starters. Sometimes we come to a corporate gathering, we, wanna, we want the worship team to start the fire. We want the preacher to start the fire. And, and, and the, you, you can't because you're like soaked wood. You can't light up soaked wood. But when there is fire in you, and now you come, you become contagious. That's where God wants us to be. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, the story of the Shunammite woman. She's hungry for God. And in verse 8 it says, and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem. This is a place where there were many people living, not just the Shunemite woman. So he passed to Shunem where it was a great woman. And, and she constrained him to eat bread. Now stop there for a moment. It wasn't that like she was looking, he was looking for her. He was just walking down the road. Representing the presence of God. It's like God saying, I want to give away myself. Who wants me? Who's hungry enough for me? Who wants to constrain me? Who's desperate enough for me? That, that you're longing for me. Because I'm, I want to stop at your house. So he winds up passing houses and places until he comes to this one woman that is hungry 
for God and she constrains him. <clears throat> that means that, that she, was, she was desperate and she, she just wasn't going to take no for an answer. You're coming in here, man. I need you. I have a lot of money. She was a wealthy lady. But there's an emptiness in my heart. I need you. I need what you have. And so as the scripture goes on here, she constrained him to eat bread. And, and so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. He, he was always going to go back to this woman who had a hunger and a desire for him. God wants to wear out a path to your heart. God wants to see an invitation of humility and meekness in your life. He wants to see a desperation that says, I, I need you, Lord. I don't just need your name. I don't just need what you can do for me. I don't just need all the wonderful blessings that you can give me. I need you. I want you. And life is not going to help me or satisfy me unless you're here with me. Desperation brings us to that place. Trouble brings us to that place. Problems can bring us to that place. And there are many ways to get there. The key is to stay there. And, and in order to live that kind of a lifestyle, you have to be aware of what it means to be broken before God, to be humbled before God, to long for His presence. And so as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Just think about how many times that God's presence is made available to us, but because there isn't a resting place for him, there isn't a hunger and a desperation in our lives, and we go through the motions, we worship, and, you know, we might not like the music, we might like the music, might not like the word, might, might, might like the word, we, but we're coming, and, and we're, our capacity for him is small, and, and, and we're okay with just a little bit of his whiff of his presence, but, but we we're, we're, we're haven't come to the place where we, we've come together, we want you. And she recognizes this, and she says, listen, this is a holy man of God. He carries the presence of God. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be when he comes to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on the day that he came, he turned to the chamber and he lay there. He rested and stayed there. Don't just come and pass by and give me a little touch, Lord. You know, I, I want, I'm going I'm I'm to make more room for you. I'm going to greater capacity. I'm going to build a little room for you because when you come, I, I want you to stay. I don't want you to just to come by and, and, and leave and right after a service. I, I want you to come and live inside me. I want you to become real inside me. I want to see the manifestation of your presence every day of my life. I want to wake up longing for you. And I want to walk down the day and, and say, Lord, I need more of you. And I want to go to bed dreaming about you. This, this is where I want to build a place to give you a resting place in me. That's what she was saying. And, and, you know, if you read the rest of the story, because the presence of God was there, he met her deepest heart's desire at a very old age. Like Abraham, he miraculously caused her to conceive and bring forth a child that she tried so much to have in her own strength, and her own power, and she put the dream aside. But because she opened her heart for his presence, God gave her the desire of her heart. See, the problems you're facing, the problems I'm facing, are nothing for God to resolve, to, to change, to, to heal, to turn around. They're nothing. We focus so much on the problem that we miss his presence as he comes by. We call out the name of Jesus. We, we cry out his word. He comes, <laughs> but there's no room because we're so focused on the problem. We're so zeroed in and how are we going to figure this thing out? What are we going to do? 
but be still and know that he's God. Put everything aside and just wait on the Lord that he'll renew your strength. And then you'll mount up with the wings of eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. The waiting is not doing anything. The waiting is pursuing him. Now I'm talking to you, but I'm saying the same thing to me. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do because we live in a society that we have a lot of abilities and a lot of talents and a lot of things that are made available to us that are just subpar as compared to what God wants to deliver to us. And, and we can get to a place where we're almost desperate, but we want to hold on to everything and control everything. And we're willing to settle for second best as long as we don't lose ourselves. Control. And that's the very thing that God wants us to do. To lose control over your own life so that he can be Lord over you. And so that what becomes your life becomes the glory of God to your family that you struggle with, to the place where you work that seem to hold back the provisions that God wants to provide for you, to the neighbors that happen to know all your frailties and will never come to church because they really know you. When His presence comes, and you're carrying his presence. Not only are the needs met in your own life, but God's beginning to reach out and cause the hunger that are in other people to be rightly directed to him. Somebody here needs to pray for that hunger to come into their lives. Somebody here recognizes what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. And, and, and you don't want to settle for just an average, ordinary, religious life. And you're willing to pay the price, the costly anointing. To empty yourself of self and to say, Lord, I want you to fill me. There's some of us tonight that have come to dead, dead ends. And thank God for that because we're here tonight and we recognize that he is the source. But there has to be a fire that's lit in us, a passion that will bring us to that place where there's less of us and more of him. Let's bow your heads with me. Yes, this is for everybody, but not everybody's there. And I don't fault you for that. Some of us still have a lot of game in us. We still got a lot of things to go and work and use and, and uh, you know, control. And we're not there yet. But there's some of us that, that, that we've been there. We've been down that road. And, 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 and we've gone through the same old, same old coming to the same old conclusions. And church alone, coming to church alone is not doing it. We come out of obligation. We come out of tradition. We come out of the fear of the Lord. But we need more than that. We need His presence. We need His presence. Now, I realize that not everybody's there, but, but I believe tonight as the Holy Spirit led me to speak on this, that there are some of you that are. I know I'm there. Normally, as God gives a message, it's usually out of my experience. Blessed are they that are hungry and thirsty for God and His righteousness. They shall be filled. If this speaks to you tonight and, and you, you can sense the Holy Spirit stirring up something in you because God wants to do more and he wants more. He wants more space. 
He's not just satisfied with that little storefront that you have. He wants to take the whole 30,000 square foot place in your heart. 